we have an exciting announcement to make. We've officially joined The Democracy Group, a new podcast network of eight shows dedicated to civic engagement and democracy. We'll be working alongside independent podcasters and organizations like the German Marshall Fund, the Niskanen Center, and the McCourtney Institute for Democracy. Sign up for the newsletter at democracygroup.org. Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Leah Stokes. She's assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and is affiliated with the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management, as well as the Environmental Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She works on energy, climate, and environmental politics and is the author of the forthcoming book, Short-Circuiting Policy, Interest Groups, and the Battle over Clean Energy and Climate Policy in the American States. This episode is all about why we have not had real long-term successes with clean energy policy in the last 30 years. There's still time to decarbonize, but we need to demand those policy changes through the ballot box. I had come to understand that the climate crisis was the biggest threat facing our society and that the energy system was the crucial thing to break the energy crisis. That if we could make progress on cleaning up our electricity system, we would have a fighting chance to tackle the climate crisis. We have to look at the ways that the fossil fuel industry and electric utilities keep the status quo in place. We have to understand the ways that they attack our attempts at progress so that we can fight back. We'll be talking about how fossil fuel and utility companies have been aggressive opponents to clean energy policies at the state level and what it will take to break the status quo. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So your book is super well-researched, and you argue that clean energy and climate policy have not enjoyed policy feedback and path dependence because of opposition from interest groups like electric utilities and fossil fuel companies at the state level. Can you explain what the terms policy feedback and path dependence mean? So within political science and public policy research, we often think about how politics can create policy. We elect a new government, they go and they create new laws, and then that changes the world. What we might think about less but is still very important is that once those policies are implemented in the world, they actually reshape politics. So, for example, if people have health care, they can be healthier and live longer and they can become politically organized and work to make sure that those benefits stay in place if, for example, a government comes to attack that health care policy. So this is the idea of policy feedback, the idea that policies, once they're implemented, in the world can reshape the political landscape and change our politics going forward. And with clean energy laws, the idea was that once they got implemented, they would kickstart new industries who would come to defend those policies. And over time, we would get more and more clean energy. Unfortunately, fossil fuel companies and electric utilities that have dirty fossil fuel energy like natural gas and coal power still retain a lot of political power. And they don't just roll over and play dead when a first small policy is passed to create the clean energy future. They come and they fight back against the new policies. And oftentimes they can roll them back and weaken them over time. And so that means we don't get this lock-in or path dependence where we get a little bit of policy and then even more and then even more. And before we know it, we have a fully clean energy system. Instead, what we see is a lot of battling between the fossil fuel incumbents and sort of the new clean energy companies. It's interesting that you say that because in the beginning, it looked like it actually was on the path to having policy feedback in the 90s when Texas first passed the landmark clean energy law. And it was basically supported on a bipartisan basis. 
what happened? How did it become derailed? Well, a lot of people are familiar with the Texas clean energy law passed in 1999. This was when George W. Bush was governor. And it was a really kind of hopeful time because, as we know, Texas is a pretty red state. And for them to lead in the clean energy transition, they passed their law a few years ahead of even California, for example. That first law created a lot of new wind energy, and it kickstarted a massive build-out in transmission lines, which is very important to support more renewable energy. What it didn't do was catalyze any new solar. And it should have because, in fact, several years later, in 2005, there was a law passed that would have required more solar energy to be built. But what happened was fossil fuel companies attacked that law. And even though it was passed, they made sure that it was never actually implemented. So how did the interest groups manage to retrench? They did uh, something that I call implementation resistance. When it came time to be implemented in the regulatory body, which in this case in electricity is called a public utility commission or a PUC, the fossil fuel companies showed up for the implementation and they argued that a certain word in the law when it was passed meant something else. So they said, look, here in the law, you said we're going to have a goal to create more wind energy. And we're also going to have a target to create more solar energy. And they said this word target, it it was a non-binding word. When we said that in the law, we meant that it was just voluntary. And that really wasn't what the legislators understood that word to mean. In fact, several people who had voted on the bill wrote to the regulatory body and said, No, hold on. That's not what we meant when we passed that law. But the opponents, these fossil fuel companies, managed to tie it up enough that the law never fully got implemented. It kind of bounced around between the governor, who was Rick Perry at that time, and the regulatory body. That meant that the solar energy goal was never binding. And today, Texas is way behind where it could be on solar energy. In fact, Texas has the most potential for solar in the whole country, yet it is nowhere near the top when it comes to solar uh, energy production. That state has kind of lost 15 years because of this opposition from fossil fuel companies. So in an ideal scenario, is it possible for them to reverse this and somehow still start a solar industry at this point? Or is it just simply too late and then there's no reversal, especially given that we are really running out of time? Other states have been acting while Texas has been procrastinating. They have made the technology cheaper. I call this policy feedback spillovers, which is basically the idea that when one state like California acts to create a lot more solar energy, that policy does not just affect California. The more that we make of a technology, the better we get at making it and the cheaper it gets. When some states go first and they start to pass these laws and build a lot of solar energy, they make it cheaper for a laggard state like Texas to eventually start building solar. And so today, Texas does have a solar industry and it is starting to create more solar But that's without a policy framework that would have created a lot more solar a lot quicker. Tell us why the utility companies are motivated to combat clean energy. Because at the end of the day, they're still owning the lines and giving us access to electricity. In the 1980s, a lot of utilities started to wake up to the climate crisis. They had these internal documents that showed that they understood what climate change was, how it was caused by fossil fuels, how it was going to likely cause them to have to change their business model because they were burning largely coal at that point in time. But rather than act and start to change the way that they were investing, they spread lies. They worked through groups like the Global Climate Coalition, which was a climate denial organization operating throughout the 1990s, to say that climate change wasn't real, that it wasn't that serious, that there was nothing that we could do about it. And that allowed them to continue to operate using the same business model that they had used for about a century, rather than thinking 
thinking about how can we get into new technologies and operate the grid in a new way, they said, we know how to run these big fossil fuel plants. We know how to make money off these big fossil fuel plants. Let's just keep doing it. And even in the early 2000s, when there were new regulations coming into place, like the mercury rule, which reduced the amount of mercury that coal plants could emit, that was a moment when electric utilities could have chosen to shut down their coal plants because they weren't economic anymore. But instead of doing that, what they did was they sunk a whole bunch of debt into those plants to retrofit them and keep them open for even longer. And it's not just private utilities that did this. Rural electric co-ops did this, public utilities did this. And so now we have a lot of fossil fuel infrastructure, including coal plants that have a lot of debt on them. These utilities don't want to shut them down because they'll end up with what is called stranded costs. And if they can't continue to charge the public for those costs, they're going to be left holding the bag. And so these utilities figure that if they can attack the new clean energy policies that require them to build new clean stuff, they can keep their old dirty stuff operating longer, and that allows them to pay off that debt that they've put into their plants. And it's not just coal. It's also new natural gas. A lot of utilities, even today, are putting in plans to their regulatory process and saying, we're going to build a lot of new natural gas. And if they do that, they're going to have those costs that they haven't paid off yet, and they're going to need to keep those plants open as long as possible in order to pay them off. And that is why these utilities have come to realize that clean energy is not in their interests and have come to attack laws and try to roll them back. Yeah, it's always about the bottom line. So I want to get into the nitty gritty of how they actually manage to get the parties to do their bidding and also how they influence public opinion. Because in the beginning, in 1999 in Texas, you mentioned it was a bipartisan law. And now basically everybody who is Republican is anti-clean energy. How did this happen? We've seen polarization on climate change and clean energy in the last 30 years. There were Republicans in, for example, the early 1990s, in the early 2000s, who were willing to act on climate. But the closer we got to acting on climate change, the more fossil fuel companies and electric utilities mobilized their resources to try to convince Republican politicians that this was the wrong thing to do. Interest groups can affect parties through a number of ways. They do it through lobbying, through giving campaign contributions, by building up their relationships with those politicians, and by wielding ideas. One of the most important things is the way that they use primaries to change the interests of politicians. So Republicans, many of them, were quite pro-climate. That was threatening to the fossil fuel industry. They said, let's get a new Republican in office who is not pro-climate change or pro-clean energy. For example, John McCain getting primaried um, fairly late in his career when he was pro-climate. And this doesn't just affect the behavior of somebody like John McCain. When other politicians in the Republican Party see that they could face a primary challenger or they could lose their seat if they're on the wrong side on climate change, then they strategically change their position, and that drives the parties farther and farther apart. So the primary system can really be weaponized by interest groups to shift the incentives for politicians on a given party. The Democrats have stayed pretty stable on climate, but the Republicans have moved really far away, and that has led us to a point where we really have gridlock, especially at the national level, but also within many states, to do even the bare minimum on climate change. It's really interesting how effective that was. They also use the court. Can you give us an example of how they can sue and win? Take, for example, the mercury rule. In 1990, there was a law passed in Congress called the Clean Air Act Amendments. This was a policy to try to strengthen some of our air pollution controls. It targeted sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxides, and mercury pollution. What a lot of people don't realize is that the mercury rule took more than two decades to finalize. And that's because if it had been implemented faster, 
would have shut down a lot more coal plants sooner. When you have to emit less mercury, you have to put control technology, what's called a scrubber. It's basically a big filter for your coal plant to reduce the amount of mercury that's going into the atmosphere and into our lakes and rivers and poisoning people. And that's quite expensive to do. Not only is it expensive to install, but from then on, it reduces the efficiency of that coal plant, making the coal plant more expensive to operate. These electric utilities understood that if that law went into effect, it would have severe consequences. And so they fought that law for decades. And it was only in the Obama administration that that law was finalized and started to change the way that coal plants had to operate. So you can see that using the court system, legally challenging rules and their implementation is a way to slow down the policies that we put on the books. It's very, very effective. Essentially, what you argue in the book is that if you want to have policy change to lock in and drive long-term change, we really have to destroy the political status quo, which is both in the courts and in the party system, or at least right now in the party system, because eventually we might have Republicans again who would be pro-climate. Given everything that you have learned in your research, what are the big takeaways for advocates for the climate that we can do in order to enact successful policies moving forward. I think a lot about how we can disrupt the power of electric utilities and fossil fuel companies and build the power of clean energy advocates. It's not easy to do because fossil fuel companies and electric utilities have a lot of power. They're very old organizations. They have a lot of money. They have very strong relationships with politicians. And so the odds are really stacked against us. We need to be building really big grassroots campaigns to sort of challenge that entrenched corporate power with mass public power. You can see some of the beginnings of that with groups like the Sunrise Movement, but they need to scale much bigger. Their goal is to get something like 3.5% of the American public to actively engage in climate action, like going on strike or attending protests, disrupting the status quo. Getting to that scale is going to be quite challenging. State legislatures could pass policies that increase the resources for clean energy advocates called intervener compensation programs. This is a law that exists in California which pays groups that go to the regulatory process, the Public Utility Commission, and advocate on behalf of the public, on behalf of the environment, on behalf of the public interest. That policy costs each Californian 17 cents annually, yet saves millions of dollars in terms of air pollution, in terms of increasing electricity costs. So if we had more states adopt that rule, it would allow us to have more resources to battle utilities in the regulatory process. What role can everyday citizens play in making clean energy policy more viable and expansion, hopefully, possible? What could I do personally? A lot of the rhetoric that's been put out there about climate change is that this is an individual problem, that we need to fly less or drive less or change our behavior. I saw somebody say that it was BP, the oil company, that was pushing a lot of that rhetoric that this is a behavior change and an individual problem. And when people understand climate change in that way, they feel a lot of guilt and a lot of shame and they feel paralyzed. And maybe they feel like they don't want to do anything about it because they don't want to change their lives. And so my book is really a repudiation of that way of thinking about the climate problem. This is a policy problem. It's about advocates and opponent interest groups battling it out. It's not about your individual behavior change. And so the question is, how can you help bolster advocates to make them more powerful in these political fights? Being plugged into an organization in your state, whether that's a group like 350 or the Sunrise Movement or the Sierra Club, These groups can help inform you when there are moments where you can write a letter to your politician or you can show up to protest. And those are the kinds of moments where your action can really make an outsized influence. 
If you still want to do things in your individual life, I would suggest that people think about how they can get off fossil fuels. Think about your house. Your house is fueled in part probably by natural gas. Natural gas is a fossil fuel that when it leaks, we call it methane, and it warms the planet a lot. So one thing you could do is you could retrofit your house to get rid of that fossil gas by using an electric hot water heater, by getting an induction stove, by getting an electric furnace or a heat pump. These are changes that you can make in your daily life that literally swap out fossil fuels for clean electricity. And the same is true for getting an electric vehicle. If you get an electric vehicle, you're no longer using oil to fuel your car, you're using clean electricity. So those are the kinds of changes that I suggest people make rather than some of the changes that we're often told that we should make that maybe people are not as excited about. I think this is really an important part because, you know, I was just having this conversation about whether we should use paper napkins or cloth <laughs> napkins. And is it worse to wash cloth napkins? How much water am I using? Or what if I put the paper towel in the landfill? You know, <laughs> which one is worse? It's so difficult to compute. And can you even do a comparison? So don't get lost in all that noise. That is, in many ways, a tool of the fossil fuel industry to make you feel disempowered, to make you feel stressed, to make you feel like you can never be perfect enough. This is not about purifying yourself. This is a political battle against vested interest groups who have created a system that we are locked into. None of us can unilaterally live in a low-carbon society, not until we disrupt the power of the fossil fuel industry. And that's why it's so important, I'd say more than your napkins or your straws or whatever, how about having a conversation about climate change with somebody once a day? Why not talk about the power of the fossil fuel industry and how they have funded climate denial for decades, how they have limited our investments in innovation federally? We are not spending almost any money from a historical perspective on clean energy innovation. But if we elect a new person in this fall, a Democrat, then we could finally start to invest money in the research and development of new technologies. And that would allow all of us to have better choices to make in the first place. You know, Bill McKibben always says that if you want to be in the climate fight, hypocrisy is the price of admission. So don't feel like you can't be talking about climate change or showing up to protest or writing a letter or getting involved politically in the climate fight because you're not pure enough. All of us are needed in the climate battle. It doesn't matter if you used a plastic straw yesterday, you should be in the climate fight. Oh, that's well said. I have a question about federal law. How would federal policy force states to change their source of energy makeup? For a long time, since the 1990s, advocates have been trying to pass a bill through Congress that would require all of our states to have these clean energy targets. What we really need to do is get our federal government to act and to pass what we would call a clean electricity standard and to say that every state in the country needs to be making progress and hitting these targets by this year. Unfortunately, although advocates tried in the 1990s to do it and they got really close in 2009 in a bill called the Waxman-Markey Bill, Electric utilities and fossil fuel companies have been very effective at blocking this policy from passing Congress. And that means we have a lot of unevenness in terms of how fast different states are moving. We have places like California that are way ahead of the curve that have a 100% clean energy target on the books. And then we have places like West Virginia that only get 5% of their electricity from clean energy sources today. We need our federal government to say that all states have to be making progress and to give financial support to make sure that all states can make progress. I'm really hopeful that in the next Congress, when we hopefully have a Democratic president, that big packages of climate policy could start to move through the legislature, setting requirements for all states to have more clean energy through a clean electricity standard, providing incentives for people to buy electric vehicles or put solar on their roof. Because right now, what you might not realize is those incentives are starting to go away. 
in December of last year, there was an opportunity to increase these incentives for people to buy electric vehicles or for people to put solar on their roof. And our Congress decided not to. We could see adoption of these really essential technologies slow down. That's at a time when we need adoption to be increasing enormously. We could also have our federal government be providing money for people to retrofit their homes in the way that I just described. There are so many things that our federal government can and should be doing. I would recommend the work of Jay Inslee when he was running for president. Several fantastic policy staffers wrote over 200 pages of ideas of what our federal government could be doing to speed up the clean energy transition and tackle the climate crisis. Why did you write this book at this time? What prompted you to do this research? I had come to understand that the climate crisis was the biggest threat facing our society and that the energy system was the crucial thing to break the energy crisis, that if we could make progress on cleaning up our electricity system, we would have a fighting chance to tackle the climate crisis. I sought to understand what are states doing to try to make the transition. And I had initially hoped to write a more positive story about the happy cases of places like California or New York or even New Mexico. But the more I dug into the cases, the more I understood that we can't just tell the happy stories. We have to look at the ways that the fossil fuel industry and electric utilities keep the status quo in place. We have to understand the ways that they attack our attempts at progress so that we can fight back. Thank you for your scholarship. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? We're on a sort of knife's edge here. And... I want people to look at that fact squarely. I want them to understand how urgent this is. I think for too long, people have said, well, we can deal with this healthcare thing first, or we can deal with this inequality thing first. And we need to deal with those things. And in fact, we should probably deal with those problems and climate change simultaneously. In fact, that's the idea of the Green New Deal, that we need to make sure people have minimum standards of living and have minimum safety nets so that they can handle the energy transition that we're all going to go through. But I want people to recognize that the climate crisis is just as bad. It is really getting desperate. And the Greta Thunberg phenomenon is so positive because she has woken up so many young people and so many people all around the world to just what a nice edge we are on in this moment. I close the conclusion of my book with a quote from her because I think it's a blending of looking squarely at how bad things are and the potential for changing it. She says something like, we must recognize how bad things are, but we can still turn this all around. We still have time. And so that makes me hopeful that we're starting to see young people in the streets organizing through the Sunrise Movement, organizing through Fridays for a Future. We're starting to elect truth tellers like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is willing to talk about the climate crisis and talk about solutions at the scale of the problem, like the Green New Deal. We have had an extremely robust debate within the Democratic primary over what it would take for the federal government to really tackle the climate crisis. And while I don't agree with everything that every candidate has said, at least we're talking about climate change. At least we have detailed thousands of words plans from pretty much all the candidates. At least they can no longer ignore this problem. So it makes me hopeful that we could have a banner year in 2020 that we could see amazing elections and that we could finally start to get policies in place at the scale of the crisis. That's my wish for this year, and I'm going to work very hard to try to make that reality come true. Hear, hear. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me on. I felt so relieved talking about the limited effects of individual behavior change we're all locked in to a dirty electrical grid and to fossil fuel burning technologies. We still should, of course, retrofit our homes to be free of fossil fuels and become climate advocates, as well as join organizations like 350.org and the Sunrise Movement. <laughs> 
the fossil fuel and utility companies have spared no expense to roll back clean energy policies, corrupt our politics by influencing primary races, and delay legislation through the courts. The barrier to decarbonization is politics. Let's demand policies that help us decarbonize. Next week, our guest is Jojo Meta. She's a co-founder of Ecological Defense Integrity, which is a nonprofit working to expand the legal consequences of destroying nature. Together with a team of lawyers, experts, and diplomats, Jojo hopes to make ecocide a crime against humanity overseen by the International Criminal Court. We'll discuss the history of ecocide, what it means to commit this crime, and how her team hopes to amend international criminal law. If damaging nature to a certain degree is actually described as a crime, then those who are in the positions of superior responsibility, so that could be CEOs, it could be government ministers, they're actually looking at the possibility of themselves being behind bars. It has a kind of weightiness that is not there with civil regulation. You're also looking at shifting the moral baseline culturally because once something's a crime and people understand that something is criminal, there also starts to be a whole movement of the culture towards condemning that thing. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for listening to Future Hindsight. The executive producer and host of this program is Mila Atmos. The audio producer and music composer is Peter Fedak. The associate producer is Miriam Zumbu. Additional production by Brooke Sayan. Listen to us online at futurehindsight.com or your favorite streaming service. That's all for this week on Future Hindsight. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to Future Hindsight. And consider sharing us on your social media or with your friends. Word of mouth is the best kind of endorsement we can get, and it helps us produce more great content in the future. Also, if you have the time to rate or review our show on whatever podcast app you use, we greatly appreciate it. It might not seem like much, but those ratings really do help. Also, feel free to drop us a line at hello at futurehindsight.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'll be back next Friday with a new show, and we hope you'll be there too.